Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The time had come in Jesus' ministry for the word about what God was doing through him to spread more broadly throughout Israel. Now to accomplish this, Jesus called 12 of his followers, and he prepared them to go to cities and villages throughout the land and proclaim to the lost sheep of the house of Israel the coming of the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus did not simply select 12 men and willy-nilly send them out. Jesus gave them a rather lengthy speech, of which our reading today is just a short introduction. It was intended to prepare them for this task. But he begins by giving them a very somber warning about what being his disciples will actually mean. Because discipleship isn't at all what those crowds thought it was. And he'd already begun to show this. In the seventh chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus told his disciples, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Being a disciple is not about prophesying, performing miracles in his name. Rather, the true disciple is the one who is known by Jesus and who does the will of the Father. In the next chapter, Jesus pointed out the two of those who offered to follow him that being a disciple of Jesus is no easy or comfortable calling. It requires putting him ahead of home, even family, possibly having nowhere to lay your head. And in the start of the ninth chapter, Jesus responds to those Pharisees who objected to his association with tax collectors and sinners. He tells them that following him is not an exercise in conventional piety. It is actually a radical reorientation to the mission of Jesus Christ himself. As he says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus came to die on the cross to save some just as these. And now as Jesus prepares to send his laborers into the harvest, he prepares them for what they will encounter. Poverty, rejection, persecution, even the loss of life, just as Jesus himself would be persecuted, would suffer, and would die. They would be dragged before governors, before kings, delivered over to death by their own brothers, by their own fathers, even by their own children. And they would be hated by all for the sake of Jesus. But Jesus' disciples will suffer these sobering prospects precisely because he sends them with his authority. Nothing about these men would equip them for these kind of brave acts, the dedication that they would exhibit. They certainly didn't represent the cream of the crop of Jewish society. Among them were a tax collector. That's so bad it's even beyond sinner, right? A social outcast hated by his own people. Another would be a rather excitable fisherman and his brother 
and two of their own business partners. There were a couple of working guys from Galilee, another fellow who liked to express doubts and uncertainties and kept always questioning what Jesus says and does. There was a political extremist and even a traitor. But what really matters is not who these 12 men were or the obvious lack of qualification for the job. What matters is that Jesus gave them his own authority to carry out the task that he had assigned to them. And authority was, was the character of Jesus' teaching. He taught with authority like no one had heard before. And Jesus showed his people that he had received authority to forgive sin. And at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And it is on this basis of his authority that he sends his followers to the ends of the earth to make disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The central task that Jesus gave, the central task that the authority granted them was in the proclamation that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now so often we hear of what they did and we marvel like they that they were able to, co to heal, to cast out demons. These were the things that amazed them. But for Jesus, the healings, the exorcisms, these were simply signs that bore witness to the coming of the kingdom of heaven. See, healing diseases and emasculating Satan's henchmen, these were signs of Jesus' final victory over the devil and all the effects of sin. And that would take place with his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. And that is the kingdom of heaven, inaugurated at the cross and growing forth ever steadier. The kingdom of heaven is here, and it comes in its fullness at the end of the age. Now, the mission of the Twelve was an extension of this mission, of the proclamation. But theirs was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And preaching to these lost sheep of the house of Israel, is it any wonder that they would be received the same way that Jesus was, with rejection and crosses of their own? But the mission would not stop there. This preaching of these twelve was just the beginning. Jesus declared that in the end times, the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And so the kingdom of heaven that the disciples were sent out to proclaim is the very same kingdom that has come to us in these last days. We who were not the lost sheep of Israel but as Jesus would describe in the Gospel of John, other sheep that are not of this fold. And so through the proclamation of the kingdom of heaven, through the means of grace, through the word and the sacraments, the forgiveness of sins is yours. And that's where it's all headed. In Christ Jesus sending the twelve to preach the kingdom, he began that harvest into which you have been gathered, in which you now participate. You are no longer sheep without a shepherd, but are a redeemed child of God, a member of that heavenly flock under the great shepherd of your soul, Christ Jesus. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds 
in our shepherd, Christ Jesus, unto the end of the age. Amen.